So, last time we started talking about uh, memory management. Uh, so today we will continue our discussion of memory management. Uh, three main concepts today are going to be fragmentation, segmentation, and paging. Last thing that we did last uh, in the previous lecture was talking about contiguous memory allocation, where each process gets a contiguous block of memory. And we talked about the three different schemes for finding a free block for a process. We give an example like this. Uh, with, let's say, three of 10, then this is reserved, then I have 30 uh, or, you know, 40. Then I have this reserved, then I have 30, then I have this reserved, and then I have uh, maybe 50. And this is reserved. So if I have a process that needs, say, uh, 20. If a process needs 20, I have three schemes. Best first fit. Clearly, for first fit, I check the list of free frames, or sorry, free uh, memory blocks in this case. So here I'm assuming that there is a list of free memory blocks. So the first one is going to be 10, doesn't fit. First, second is going to be 40. This is going to fit. So first fit is going to give me this. But if I do best fit instead, this is going to be the best fit. So I would have to, to find the closest, the, the free block with the closest size to what I'm looking for. Uh, and in this case, the closest is going to be, or the smallest that fits, is going to be the 30. So this is best fit. Now, worst fit in this case will be what? 50. And last time we said that worst fit is not as bad as the name implies, because worst fit has a, an advantage. And what's the advantage in using 50 here, or in allocating 50 to this process that is requesting 20? Yeah. You have 30 still left. Yeah. So I have 30 left, and what? why is that an advantage? Because it's better than, say, having 10 left. Yes. So because larger leftover is more likely to be useful. So the idea is <coughs> larger leftover is more likely to be useful. <coughs> Smaller leftover may not be useful. Like this best fit here, if I give it uh, the 30, and uh, I use this free block, I will have a, a leftover of 10, and this leftover of 10 may never be useful, because all the requests or all the subsequent needs are going to be greater than 10. So this 10 will never be used. So that's why I think uh, these should be named smallest fit <coughs> and largest fit. Because this is not necessarily worse than best fit. Or at least it's not worse than best fit in all cases. You can easily construct uh, a case or you know, a sequence of requests where uh, you know, the so-called worst fit gives better results than best fit. However, it has been found experimentally that uh, in, you know, statistically, uh, first fit and best fit give better results than worst fit in terms of uh, space utilization. And this, by the way, uh, you know, the same problem of uh, storage allocation, same problem is seen in memory and in this story. So many of the concepts that we will be 
uh, that we will be discussing in memory management will be discussed again. We will see them again in disk management because allocating uh, uh, you know, space in memory and allocating space on disk have uh, much in common. Okay, and in terms of speed, clearly, which one is the fastest speed here? First fit. First fit, obviously, because you don't have to search. Okay, now, this reviews the last thing that we did last time. Now, today's new concept is the concept of fragmentation, which is a very important concept in memory management and disk management. What does fragmentation mean? Okay, so fragmentation. Let's say that a process needs 70 units of memory or 8 let's make it 8 if a process needs 8 with contiguous memory allocation will we be able to find a contiguous block for this process of size 8 no we don't have a contiguous process we, we don't have a contiguous block that satisfies this need now, this is what we call external fragmentation. Why? Because we do have a total of 80, but that's fragmented. So we have even more than 80. What's the total amount of free space that we have? The total amount of free space that we have is 10 plus 40, that's 50, plus 30 is 80, plus 50, we have 130. So we have 130 of total free space. And this is requesting 80. So what's, what this process is requesting is less than what we have <coughs> free, but unfortunately we cannot use it because it's fragmented. It's, it's not in one piece, it's in multiple pieces. So this is what we call external fragmentation. Well, why external? We will understand why external when we understand the concept of internal fragmentation which is what I'm going to explain next. What's the concept of internal fragmentation? Now, suppose that I have a process that needs 25 units of memory. 25 units of memory. If, instead of giving this process 25, I give it 30. So say process X needs 25 and I just give it 30. So in this case, the process will be using the 25, and I will have five, uh, five units of memory that the process is not using. So if a process requests 25, and the system for some reason that we will try to understand in a minute, gives it 30 instead of 25, these five that the process has but doesn't use or doesn't need is internal fragmentation. This is internal fragmentation. Now, now it should be clear why we call this, we call the previous example the request for 80 resulted or uh, showed that we have external fragmentation and why this is internal fragmentation. External fragmentation is space or unutilized space that doesn't belong to any process, while internal fragmentation is unutilized space that belongs to a process, to one process. So we call this internal fragmentation because it's space that we cannot use that belongs to one process. While in the previous example, the example where a process was requesting 80, and we had a total of 130, but we didn't have 80 in one piece, that's external fragmentation because we have 130 units that are, uh, <coughs> that are free, but cannot be uh, used at this uh, for this particular request. Okay, so this is the any question on the difference between internal and external fragmentation? Okay, now when I say 
a process is requesting 25, but the system gave it 30. Why would the system do that? <coughs> Why do you think the system would do that? Do you see an advantage in giving 30 to a process that is requesting 25 or that needs 25? Maybe five is maybe five is too small for it to um, for it to fit anything else. And so when you have to go through and search through, you, you don't want to have to search through that um, that five block to see if it'll fit because you already know that five really isn't going to fit anything. So you just give it the whole block. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's what it is. So if if I give it 25 here, if I give it 125 and leave this five, this block of size five or this small block of memory, I will have to put this on my in my free list. So my free list will have this five in it. And the disadvantage of putting this five in my free list is that if I keep doing this, if I keep putting these smaller blocks of memory in my free list, my free list is going to grow big. So I will have a big free list. And that big free list will have lots of blocks in it that are too small to be useful. Okay. So this is the, this is the point. I will be filling my free list with many small blocks that are unlikely to be useful. When you say a process needs 25, is that an estimate or is, is that a value that was somehow calculated? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an estimate, yeah. It's, uh, so this is an estimate. So at this point, we are assuming that we know uh, what the process needs. Yeah. Even though it's not, you know, things are not as simple as that. But, you know, this is not the, uh, the issue that we are focusing on at this point. We are focusing on the issue of allocating memory, assuming that we know how much memory each process needs. But, you know, later on we will talk about, we will, you know, present more dynamic schemes that will, uh, you know, give memory to a process on demand. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's good to be questioning this at this point. Okay, so do you understand now why, uh, you know, the system may give a process more than what it needs. In fact, when we uh, when we talk about paging in a few minutes, we will see that you know a page has a fixed size, and the system will give a process uh, you know multiple pages. It's not going to give a fraction of a page. Uh, so it will give the integer multiples of pages. Uh, okay. So this is the concept of fragmentation. Now. One possible solution, yes. Does it actually give it five, or does it mark, does it just mark five as like taken? Yeah, so it will mark the whole 30 block to be allocated to the process. So the 30, a block of size 30 will be allocated to a process, and that, that process will be using only 25. Okay, now, when we look at this, someone may say, Okay, I know how to fix this problem, this fragmentation, this external fragmentation problem. Uh, so let me just, you know, make some kind of compaction. So let me, if this is uh, memory for process one, this is memory for process two, this is for process three. Uh, and, you know, this is process four. So let me just do some compaction, move them around and so I will have this is process one and then I move the block for process two to be adjacent to it so this is process two and I move the block for process three to be adjacent to process two and process four same thing so in this case I do this compaction and then I will have this nice uh, big free block of memory that has the 130 blocks free. So this looks like a logical solution, uh, you know, at least on the board. But why do you think this is not a very practical if solution? Yes, yeah. The sizes of the processes might be too big to make that practical. So time spent reorganizing memory. Okay, moving, yeah. yeah. Yeah, moving this, for example, this block, it's in here, so I will have to move it to this block. So that, you know, the system can do this, by the way, only if we have execution time binding. 
Right? Remember last time we talked about different kinds of binding, compile time binding, uh, load time binding, and uh, execution time binding. Now, if a process has this, the process has already been compiled a long time ago, the code has been compiled, and the process has been loaded a long time ago. So compile and bind time by, uh, compile and load time binding are, are not options at this point. Uh, the only option that we have is execution time binding because this process is now executing. So I'm gonna move the process while it's <coughs> executing, but the system will do that. And the system will do that by changing the base the base address of that process. So if this is, uh, you know, this is address uh, 5,000, then the system will change the base address for this process from 5,000 to say 2,000. And then it's moved here. But just like, you know, real life, you know, when you move from one place to another, you don't just change your address. You have to move all of your stuff, right? So it's, uh, otherwise, you know, e e people would have been moving every day. You know, moving would have been very easy. But you don't just change your address and then you are done. You have to move everything. So here you will have to move this uh, uh, memory, this code and data from this location to this location. And this is, this is expensive. Right. You move a process in memory, so that move is expensive. And it's not, it's not something that you will do you know, only once to solve the problem and the problem is solved permanently. So by doing this, you will not permanently solve the problem. Why? Because if if the process, if you have, like, if P1 is a process that executes for only a short amount of time, and then it vanishes, now you've got the same problem to where now you've got an empty block, and then processes, and then that. So you might need to do that every time a process finishes. You'll have to do that sort of uh, rearranging. Right. Right. Or at least not whenever. A process finishes, but you'll have to do it very frequently. Right. You know, whenever you have a, a serious fragmentation problem, you'll have to uh, to do this compaction, and you'll have to move processes around. So, because the system is dynamic and processes keep coming and going, and uh, you know, new processes arrive and processes terminate, uh, things are dynamic. So uh, you'll have to keep fixing this. You know, whenever there is a fragmentation problem, you'll have to reapply compaction, and that's expensive. That takes uh, time. So, uh, this has uh, led to the conclusion that continuous memory allocation is not a good idea. It doesn't allow us to, to utilize space uh, very uh, efficiently. It's not a good way of utilizing space, so we must divide the address space of a process into pieces. We cannot just treat the address space of a process as one piece. We must divide it into pieces. And that's why people came up with the ideas of segmentation and paging.